Welcome back, you guys. Uh, we are going to continue uh, following last week's portion of the deep dive of terms and conditions, kind of hopping into um, some creeds, the Apostles' Creed, other things. Super, super good stuff. Um, if you haven't watched that, go back, watch that, because it is going to expand, or today is going to expand on what we talked about then. Yeah. Um, and it's, yes, me again, Sarah, Josh, back to further our topic of the creeds. So let's get back to this uh, council. And yes. so this guy shows up, he says some things about Jesus that are like super wacky, not right. Then more people argue and you know, what happens from there? So they, they come up with this statement. Uh, we believe in one God, the father of almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. Mm. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God, begotten of the father, uh, and then there's a bracket here that I didn't look up the meaning of, but it goes, uh, begotten of the Father, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. So Big not words. <laughs> consubstantial thinks substance, mm -hmm. and then con means with. Yep. So it's not like substance. Mm -hmm. It's not identical substance. It is mixed like the substance of Jesus mm -hmm. is with the substance of God. Yeah, so it's there. trying to illustrate the relationship there. Right. It's like okay. uh, if you make Kool-Aid, mm -hmm. the powder and the water are consubstantial in that it's like one substance. Mm -hmm. So if you're a scientist, the word there is homogenous. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, uh, there's a I'm very a similar word to describe this view of the Trinity mm. that I don't have memorized. That's okay. Uh, um, man, yes, continue. Uh, who for uh, us men and our salvation came down and was incarnate and was made man. Mm. He suffered and on the third day rose again, ascended into heaven, and thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead mm -hmm. and in the Holy Ghost. Yeah, so a little this, bit different. Yeah, this was not a... Here is everything you need to know as a rough outline of faith. Mm, like the Apostles' Creed. Right. This is a, here is a true statement to combat this heresy mm. of Jesus is less than God, mm -hmm. or Jesus isn't man, mm -hmm. or Jesus, like just what's up with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we see um, Jesus is very God of very God, begotten, not made, with the same substance as with the Father, mm -hmm. um, coexisting, homogenous with the Father. Mm -hmm. And that he was incarnate and was made man, so he was fully man as well. Right. Getting it, at that balance of... Right. And so this was uh, uh, very, you know, it's a very true statement. Mm -hmm. And it was a very important statement in sort of the beginning of trying to really... Uh, clarify what is sound doctrine. Okay. So we see like a difference in this, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed of like, Apostles' Creed is a little bit more encompassing to um, other parts of like theological doctrine. This is, you know, a little bit more pointed, like you said, to Jesus. Yeah. Both have similar effects in use, but original purpose are a little bit different. Yeah, and they're both short enough that, that anyone could memorize them with just mm -hmm. a couple of repetitions. Mm -hmm. And so it really made this complex idea of who is Jesus and how does he work mm -hmm. available to the masses mm -hmm. for everyone to understand the sound theology. Gotcha. It, it'd be hard to go up to some, you know, random farmer and mm -hmm. be like, hey, let's look at this verse and this verse and this verse and this verse and tie them all together mm -hmm. and try to get you that understanding. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier to say, hey, here is a statement put together by all of the church leaders mm -hmm. about who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And by memorizing this, you have an idea when you hear stories about Jesus, who's being talked about. Mm -hmm. And, and when people make weird claims about Jesus, you know they're wrong. Right, right. It becomes this filter that you can, this tool to help um, ground your faith in truth. 
Um, and uh, even though, you know, like we have these things today, we either use these creeds or there are other statements that like we know to be true that we, um, you know, like I, at least I do. I use yeah. them to keep me rooted in what I know um, through what the Holy Spirit reveals. So, um, yes, yeah, so tell me more about like updates and how this Nicene Creed kind of so, took off. So, uh, I'm going to go with just sort of a, a sort of drive by of the next, you know, 100, 200 years. <laughs> okay. And that's uh, in 381, the uh, First Council of Constantinople uh, sort of expanded this. Um, mm. they, they added some things to uh, try to add clarity. Mm. And there wasn't a immediate sort of uh, great acceptance of these additions, mm. but it wasn't because they, were, they disagreed with them. It was because in, in 431, uh, well, it was in 431, rather, not because, because the Council of Constantinople was first. Mm -hmm. There was a Council of Ephesus, and in that, they had, one of the things that they appro approved was, uh, when these things have been read, the Holy Synod decreed that it is unlawful for any man to bring forward or to write or to compose a different faith as a rival to that established by the Holy Fathers assembled with the Holy Ghost in Nicaea. So it mm -hmm. is unacceptable, uh, it is unlawful within the church mm -hmm. to propose a uh, doctrine counter to this. And not, on, not only, and some, that took that to a degree of, of when it says different, is it talking about different as in this contradicts, or is it talking about different in that if we write something that's true about the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. is that allowed? Mm. Because that's not the same thing. Gotcha. And so it was like this like roadblock of like the Council of Ephesus. People sat down and said like, hey, we like these things. Let's not ruin it. You can't make anything different. And so yeah. then people were like, different as in wrong or different as in different? Right. Different as in not covered by this. Right, right. And so, uh, and then it goes into like, hey, if anyone does this, like, they're out. They are not viewed as, <laughs> as a Christian who is practicing this well. Like, if you're a bishop, you're no longer a bishop. Gotcha. You, so then they express some consequences. If yeah. It's like a contract almost yeah. that you have no choice in. Yeah. And so gotcha. the, the, Scary. The, uh, the creed they read there was the, the first edition. Of the Nicene Creed. Right. And the... But I'm going to go into the second one because it came into uh, some degree of use and there's a clause in there that's uh, important that we'll, I'll use to sort of cap sort of mm -hmm. creeds. To clarify really quick, so the first Council of Nicaea happened, they made their Nicaean Creed, um, and then later, um, you know, some About 50, 55, yeah, 50 years 56. later, um, the first Council of Constantinople, hard to say, yep. occurs and they just, you know, they kind of elaborate a little bit more yep. on this Nicene Creed and they give things that are still true. Yep. They're just extra added to make it more clear. And then later this Council of Ephesus happens and they're like, yeah, yeah, well this other one, throw that out because it's different than the Nicene Creed and we don't want those changes. It, it was more of like anything that's not this, not true. Okay. And, or not acceptable. And so there was a little bit of, of uh, does this mean anything else, period, or does it mean anything that contradicts? Mm. And so the, this, uh, the one made by the First Council of Constantinople, uh, the opposition to it wasn't that it was intrinsically wrong. Okay. It was that it was different. Mm. And, the expansion part. Right, and, and theology doesn't change. Okay. Like, what is true doesn't change, right. I should say. Yes. And so they were opposed to having it change more so than the ideas included. Okay. And so... Continue. Uh, some of those changes, like, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, mm. whereas the original didn't include heaven and earth. 
and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. So, added the only begotten. Right. The no one was disagreeing that Jesus was the only begotten Son of God, but the Second Council added it like there were no others. Mm -hmm. Begotten of the Father before all worlds. So before, essentially before any time, that was added. Mm. Light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down, and then they added from heaven, and was incarnate, and then they added by the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary, mm -hmm. and was made man. He was, and then they added, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, mm -hmm. uh, and then the original word suffered, and then they added, and was buried. That sounds very similar to the Apostles' Creed. I was just about to say that. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting, the way that they now kind of seem to be interwoven. And the third day rose again, they added, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. Mm. Uh, so... A lot of expansion there, but a lot of expansion we've already heard in the Apostles' Creed. Which is interesting. From thence he shall come, and they added again with glory, to judge the living and the dead. Mm. And then they added the phrase, whose kingdom shall have no end. Mm -hmm. And then the first <laughs> Nicene Creed just ended, and in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Done. Yeah, they, they were in the Holy Spirit. abrupt. Uh, so the... The second one added, and in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. Mm -hmm. In one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Hmm. What so, do you got for us? So uh, the, the, um, there's not a lot of controversy here. That, that what some people could ask, when it says one baptism for the remission of sins, is that saying water baptism pays for sins? Mm. But at the same time, uh, baptism is, is used, you know, as a symbol of, of following Christ. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus talked to Nicodemus about, hey, you need to be, you know, born of the spirit again. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's not just by water. Mm -hmm. I, you know, baptism by the spirit is talked about. And so um, that could use clarification, but isn't a necessarily a stumbling block. Right. And so a lot of this we see Nothing about that was like, oh, they inserted some heresy. Right, right, right. But we saw that it was, hey, maybe there were some, some other creeds that they're like, it'd be nice to just have one. Mm -hmm. And let's sort it of... It seems to be more encompassing, yeah. I would say. Yes. It's so interesting. Now, uh, what happened is later on they added in the, the section on the Holy Ghost, uh, who proceeds from the Father, they added the phrase, and from the Son. Mm -hmm. And that is called, called the filioque clause because that's the, how the word and from the sun looks in, in Latin, I think. Okay. But what happened was, uh, if we understand proceeds to be, um, you know, sent out, mm -hmm. totally sound theologically. Right. If we understand it to be like produced from, mm. right, that's weird. And so there's, there's an issue where um, the Latin is a little more clear than the Greek. Okay. And, and it's not that the Greek necessarily is strictly heretical. It's just it's less clear. Gotcha. And what happened is the Eastern Orthodox, the Eastern part of the church was like, you are changing a creed. Bad. Right. Can't Stop be it. done. Illegal. Yeah. And, <laughs> Grounds for expulsion. <laughs> yeah, and this, this was added in the, the 7th century, so like uh, 300 years later. Okay. And the, so the Eastern Church was like, you can't do that. 
You're changing your creed. We talked about this in Ephesus. <laughs> you can't do that. Being, Big fit comes. Yeah, being right is important, and we this needs to be vetted. Mm -hmm. And sort of the Western side of the church was like, but it's theologically correct, okay. so we don't care about, you know. You. <laughs> we're, we're not, yeah, we're not going to call a council and get all the church together to approve a single word. And for the son or the yeah. okay. Is yeah. that how you say that? Yeah. And, we're, and, and so it's sound theology, so you deal with it. Mm. And the, there was a lot of tension between the Eastern and the Western sort of parts of the church. Uh, there was this like, hey, if there's one leader of the church, where does he sit? Does he sit in Constantinople? Does he sit in Rome? Mm. Like, where does the power of the church sort of central, centralize? Mm -hmm. And there were political forces as well, because at this time, being influential in the church meant being influential. Mm -hmm. and, in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, here we see that the, the creed, a difference in creed, uh, contributed to the uh, breaking of the Eastern and Western parts of the church. Mm. Into the so it's Eastern very Orthodox. Into, yeah. There's the Roman Catholic in the, the West, and I realized that maybe for you I should. It's fine. You would, Roman Catholic on the West <laughs> yeah. and uh, Eastern Orthodox on the East. And the, the issue, there were so many issues that were going on besides this. Mm. There were so many political issues. There were so many power struggles. Mm -hmm. There was so much, like, we could, we could film a month of deep dives and not. Just not, about the divi divisions yeah, in the church. And yeah. still not do an adequate job. But the... It was so easy to point to a creed mm -hmm. and say, you have not respected this creed, mm -hmm. so you're out. Sure. And for them to say, you are not respecting sound theology in, by us you know, improving the creed, right. so you're out. And so we see that um, it was not only super important for determining sound theology within ourselves, mm. sound theology for the layman. But it was viewed as this sort of authoritative, like mm. we have consolidated truth into these simple things. Okay. So, and this truth has such force that we're fine splitting the church over it. Wow. And so uh, creeds are very helpful, very important to read. Um, because it's, it's all of these people from like these, these ancient times who were looking at the Bible and trying to hash it out. Mm -hmm. And it, they're not on the same level as scripture. Mm -hmm. But what it is is you have, you know, hundreds of men who spent their lives devoted to trying to understand scripture, trying to come up with statements of truth for everyone to understand. Right. And so by not taking the time to, to read them, you're, you're missing out. Right. I think that's such an important distinction is like these creeds, while packed to the brim with truth, don't supersede the value and the holiness of scripture. Yeah. Um, they're supplemental, but incredibly helpful. Um, I think it's also really interesting the like divisiveness of this like expansion of the Nicene Creed and um, how it just shows like how important these were in the way back the way back because there are these pillars of truth that you know like people were willing to die for yeah. so if you change a creed you change the understanding the theological understanding of the vast congregation right right they have really big rooted power like you said because of um, how inaccessible the Bible was for a really long time. So, yes, wonderful. Ah, oh, man. Okay, so can you just clarify it really quick? Like, just when we think about creeds, we think about the Apostles' Creed, we think about the Nicene Creed, and, you know, this expansion from Constantinople. Um, what is, like, just what, what are you trying to hit home? What is the value and the takeaway of yeah. today? So, if you didn't have a Bible... Uh, you would 
not really have an idea what you believed without mm-hmm. someone really teaching you firmly. Mm-hmm. And that's something that we've moved away from using creeds. Mm-hmm. But we also have a lot of people who don't really understand what they believe. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people here in America, and you probably know them, who are like, yeah, I'm a Christian. And they're mm-hmm. like, what does that mean? And they're, they've got nothing. Yeah, just... Pause. I grew up going to Sunday school. Uh huh. Or not even that. It's just like my parents told me we yeah, are. Yeah, so we, we are. celebrated Easter. Mm-hmm. I open Christmas presents on Christmas. Yeah. I'm a Christian. Yeah. Not and quite. so, and so the uh, this is a a very clear framework of here's doctrine. Mm. If you don't believe it, it shows you what questions you need to be asking. Mm-hmm. And if you do believe it, then you can compare things to it and be like, is this sound? Hmm. Is this idea of Jesus, you know, or whatever sound? Mm-hmm. It almost becomes a litmus test of like, you know, it, let's say I'm a stranger on the street and I'm telling yeah. you I'm a Christian. You, you might ask me certain parts of this. And if I say no to any of them, then you I should have some pause for concern. Or basic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know if the paper turns red or blue. Yeah. Uh, man, high school science joke. Um, but yeah, it, it gives you some room to be like, oh, okay, there's some holes here theologically. Um, as a believer, you can you know guide someone's faith that way. Right. And this believing in the creed is not a replacement for believing in God. Exactly. Good point. It's uh, more so that what does it mean to believe in God if I don't have a framework for solid truth, Mm -hmm. let me learn. Yeah, yeah. And this is a very easy place to like start learning that the church used for hundreds Mm -hmm. and hundreds of years. It's foundational framework. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Well, so if you were to, you know, pull a... Christian from the way back to the way back and talk to them now, you know, what would they tell you or you tell them like about this creed of like the difference between knowing and owning versus? They would probably be surprised at how hard it is for the common Christian to articulate a clear statement of belief. Mm -hmm. Um, But they would also be surprised at how accessible it was to go deep independently. Mm, yes, there's sort of like, you get, you you can have a more individual experience um, now that you may not have been able to have unless you were educated or literate, which was not the case for most. Yeah. So um, I think also, like you said, we understand that there's, you know, this value, there was and still is, but in a different manifestation, this value of having an understanding and owning um, Understanding the importance of owning your faith, which looks like knowing what you believe, being able to articulate that, like you said, this sort of framework, as opposed to just assuming that you have faith by passivity and inheritance, which is still a problem we have to today, to today, in today. Yes, in today. (laughs) So, yeah. Anything else that you want to add, Josh? Uh, You should know what you believe. Mm. And... uh creeds for how the early church did that. Yeah, yeah. Would you say that it's okay to, you know, keep creeds in your pocket? Would you encourage our students Yeah, to... I mean, it, it, they don't necessarily serve the purpose of like, I'm in a disagreement with someone at school. Here's a creed, <laughs> right? It, it's a card that you play. <laughs> right. Uh, real life interactions are not a game of Uno. Right, this is true. But... Super, you can't reverse with the Holy Spirit or something. I would say it would be super helpful to to go through the creeds and be like, what is this? Do I believe this? If not, I know what questions I need mm-hmm. to be asking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like, where is this in the Bible? And, and almost use this as a framework for study Ooh. until you're confident in what's included in these. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's excellent advice. Students, if you're watching this, or not students, whoever you are, audience, hello. You, I would encourage you, just as Josh said, to look up these creeds. See, do I believe these things? Or even back before that, do I understand what it's saying? Do I understand what this word means? Um, communion of saints and all no. these things. Figure out what it's saying. Once you know what it's saying, do you know if that's true? 
Like, do you identify with that to be true? If not, then man, you have got some time to just explore um, and the Holy Spirit will do things. Um, and we're here too. Mainly this guy. I could help a little bit, but I'll probably just revert and direct you to Josh. Um, but it's a beautiful way to kind of foster intimacy with the Lord um, and have a little bit of your brain kind of be boggled by the Trinity in some senses too um, while meditating on what is true. Man, so good. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. We will be back next week with even more. Josh, what can they look forward to? Uh, I'm not sure. From here, there's a jumping off point to church history. Mm. There's also a jumping off point into theology. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. Stay tuned. Cliffhanger. Now, let us know what you want to learn about, and that would make choosing <laughs> yes yes um if there are topics that we're not touching on or things that um stem further questions you can always comment down below you can find us on social media or you can show up here and talk to this guy so thanks for coming yep. we'll see you next week bye